like to welcome you all here in the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, especially our guests from Germany. Uh, we are uh, also, I would like to thank you for uh, participating in our uh, cultural program, the Alexandria Project cultural program, uh, which aims at educating, edu educating the public about uh, the cultural heritage of ancient Alexandria and its great library. Um, it is with great pleasure and honor uh, I would like also to welcome uh, Professor uh, Heinrich uh, Pistafield. Uh, it is very, uh, uh, it is really our honor to have him with us here in the Biblioteca Alexandrina. Thank you for uh, accepting to uh, participate in our cultural program. With pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, professor Pistafield, uh, he's an emeritus uh, professor in Bochum University in Germany, uh, and he's one uh, of the leading professors uh, and scholars of Arabic and Islamic studies. Uh, professor Pistafield today will talk about uh, the transfer of Hellenistic scho uh, scholarship from the School of Alexandria to the court of Baghdad. So please welcome Professor Pistafield. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Hosni. I'm very pleased to see so many uh, people here interested in this really fascinating story of how the Greek sciences, the Hellenistic sciences, Al Ulum Al Qadima, uh, journeyed from this place actually to Baghdad and further on. I'm starting with a dream. One night, the Abbasid Caliph al Ma'mun had a dream. And the account of the dream is on page one of your handout. It's taken from the famous um, book catalog called Al Fihrist, Kitab al Fihrist by Ibn al Nadim. Um, and uh, the English translation is roughly like the following. He dreamed, that is to say Al Ma'mun dreamed, that he saw a man of reddish color, a reddish white complexion with a high forehead, bushy eyebrows, a bald head, dark blue eyes and handsome features sitting on his chair. Is the microphone all right with you? Yes, yes. Good. Al-Ma'mun said, now Al-Ma'mun himself is speaking, I saw in my dream that I was standing in front of him filled with awe. I asked, who are you? He replied, I'm Aristotle. I was delighted to be with him and asked, oh philosopher, may I ask you some questions? He replied, ask. I said, what is the good? He replied, whatever is good uh, according to intellect. I asked, then what? He replied, whatever is good according to religious law. I asked, then what? He replied, whatever is good in the opinion of the masses. I asked, then what? And he replied, then there is no more then. And according to another tradition, I think appended by, uh, by um, Ibn al-Nadim uh, to his um, paragraph, I said, uh, Al-Ma'mun said, tell me more. And Aristotle replied, he who gives you sincere counsel about gold, consider him to be like gold. It is your duty to declare the oneness, the oneness of God. One sentence into this remarkable account, we know of course this is fiction, for one, the vivid description of the outward appearance of the first philosopher is too beautiful to be true. Secondly, the encounter of the standing ruler uh, and the sitting philosopher create an exemplary, idealized emblem of secular power and timeless wisdom of Arabic, Islamic, and Greek Hellenistic culture, and if you want, of Baghdad and Alexandria. And thirdly, 
the subsequent exchange of question and answer bear the stamp of a general moral to be communicated. Dreams must be taken seriously, as Dimitri Gutas writes in his book, Greek Thought, Arabic Culture, which to my uh, pleasure I see on display outside the, um, uh, uh, the uh, place we were uh, convening here. Um, the name is Gutas, G-U-T-A-S, and he's one of the best um, um, experts on what I'm talking about. Greek thought, Arabic culture. Um, dreams must be taken seriously, he writes. Their emotive content makes them preferred means for the communication and diffusion of ideas, um, attitudes, positions, indeed for propaganda uh, in most societies and certainly in Greek and Arab. So much for the quotation from Gutas's book. Well, what does the dream want to tell us? We find this version, as I said, in Alma, of Alma Amun's dream in Ibn al nadims famous catalogue, compiled in Baghdad in 987. From all the available evidence, it would appear that it was Yahya ibn Adi, Christian. Um, student of Al-Farabi, head of the Baghdad Aristotelians uh, in the mid-10th century and personally acquainted with Ibn al-Nadim, who transmitted this dream account to the author. Ibn al-Nadim introduces the section of his catalog, which he calls, Why There Are So Many Books to Be Found on Philosophy and the Other Ancient Sciences. I think that's part of the handout to, yeah, Dhikr al-Sabab and so on. Um, <clears throat> he introduces this section um, with the words, one reason for this is Al Ma'amun's dream, and then goes on to tell the dream and concludes with a summary statement. I quote, this dream was one of the firmest reasons for the translation of books into Arabic through the sponsorship of Al Ma'amun, end of quote. So the starting point for Ibn Anadim is the evidence um, uh, in his own bookshop in Baghdad of so many books um, on al ulum al qadima be they translations or commentaries or summaries. The authority behind this is the first philosopher, uh, al-Failasuf al-Awwal, Aristotle, and the prime receiver and prom pro promulgator of this heritage is the caliph al-Ma'mun himself. And the guiding principle principles of his policy, what is the good, al-Hasan, are the intellect, the, relig the religious law, and the masses, uh, with, let me stress this, the primacy of reason, and hence of falsafa, the discipline that studies it, in all matters over religious authority, as well as political considerations, the masses. Just as logic is superior to grammar, this is, uh, as some of you know, the topic of a famous munadhara uh, between Abu Bishr Mata and Asi Rafi in 932, that is one year before Al Ma'amun's death, in that it is universal and supralingual, so also is philosophy, the use of reason, superior to religion in that it is universal and supranational, since each nation has its own religion. This is the intellectual and political agenda uh, of both the ruler Al Ma'amun and the Aristotelian philosopher Yahya ibn Adi, and the dream offers us a precious snapshot of current ideological currents, Mu'tazili, if you want, in early Abbasid times. If we subtract the tendentious elements from that fascinating dream, uh, enough solid and important features of the story from Alexandria to Baghdad remain. For one, the sheer wealth of first and second hand uh, material dealing with al ulum al qadima in Arabic literature and culture in general. Uh, second, the prime authority of Aristotle. Three, the pairing of philosophical intellect or reason and relig religious law <clears throat> as guiding principles, and fourthly, the immediate 
patronage of the reception of Hellenistic scholarship in classical Islam through the hands of the ruling Abbasids and their court. Let me follow up this dream with a much later, more than 400 years later, and more detailed account of the story from Alexandria to Baghdad given by Ibn Khaldun, and that's exhibit number two, uh, filling the rest of the page one of your handout, uh, in the third part of his uh, Al Muqaddimah. Aristotle, Wakana Aristo, Wakana Aristo are the first words, the last word of line one. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Uh, the ruler of the Greeks who defeated the Persians and deprived them of their realm. He was the greatest scientist and enjoyed the greatest prestige and fame. He has been called the first teacher. He became world famous. This is the translation of uh, Franz Rosenthal, three volumes, um, um, I think still available in the bookshops. When the Greek dynasty was destroyed and the Roman emperors seized power and adopted Christianity, the intellectual sciences were shunned by them as religious groups and their laws require. But they continued to have a permanent life uh, in scientific writings and treatments which were preserved in their libraries. The Roman emperors later on took possession of Syria. The, the ancient scientific books continued to exist during their rule. Then God brought Islam and its adherents gained their incomparable victory. They deprived the Byzantines as well as other nations of their realms. At the beginning, they were simple in their ways and disregarded the crafts. Eventually, however, the Muslim rule and dynasty flourished. The Muslims developed, developed a sedentary culture such as no other nation had ever possessed. They became versed in many different crafts and sciences. Then they desired to study the philosophical disciplines. They had heard some mention of them by the bishops and priests among their Christian subjects. And man's ability to think has, in any case, aspirations in the direction of the intellectual sciences. Abu Jafar al-Mansur, reigning from 754 to 775, therefore sent to the Byzantine emperor and asked him to send him translations of mathematical works. The emperor sent him Euclid's books and some works on physics. The Muslims read them and studied their contents. Their desire to obtain the rest of them grew. Later on, al Ma'mun came. He had um, some scientific knowledge Therefore, he had a desire for science. His desire aroused him to action in behalf of the intellectual sciences. He sent ambassadors to the Byzantine emperors. These ambassadors were to discover the Greek sciences and to have them copied in Arabic writing. He sent translators for that purpose into Byzantine territory. As a result, a good deal of the material was preserved and collected. And then I'm, I'm skipping some lines um, down to the uh, uh, third last line, beginning wa with uh, Wadakhala. Um, in, in, the, in the section which I'm skipping, uh, some exponents, some representatives of the uh, philosophical sciences are named. Uh, in the east, it's Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina. In the West, it's uh, Ibn Rushd and Ibn Baja. And for the interesting subspecies of occult sciences, he names Jabir Ibn Hayyan and Al-Majriti, the man from Madrid, famous uh, 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 author of a book uh, called Picatrix, Rayat al-Hakim. And then, in the end of uh, the uh, quotation from uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, it says the intellectual sciences and their representatives succeeded to some degree in penetrating Islam. They seduced many people who were eager to study those sciences and accept the opinions uh, expressed in them. In this respect, the sin falls upon the person who commits it. If God had wanted it, they would not have done it. Uh, uh, a quote from Quran 
uh, Surat al-An'am, verse 137. Finally, Ibn Khaldun follows the way of the ancient sciences towards the east, Transoxania, that's not on your um, handout, on the one hand, and recently, as he says, towards the west, what he calls the northern shore of the country of the European Christians. So this is contemporary to his own writing. Again, as in Al Ma'mun's dream, you find here in Ibn Khaldun's overview a number of central factors in the transmission of Hellenistic scholarship to Arabic culture. That is, the principal authority of Aristotle, the embodiment of philosophy, um, the instrumental initiative of the Abbasid court. This time it is closer to the actual historical facts, Abu Jafar. Uh, Jafar al-Mansur, the builder of Baghdad, whose name is highlighted in securing translations of the Greek text, and the relation, in this uh, context, a little bit disturbed relation between the intellectual sciences and the laws of Islam. Two interesting details are new compared to al Ma'mun's dream, one of them specific to Ibn Khaldun's theory, theory of history, the other common to quite a few further Arabic accounts of the process from Alexandria to Baghdad. Ibn Khaldun lets begin the cultivation of the crafts and the sciences only in a sedentary culture. Typically for him, scholarship can flourish only in urban civilization. And as a polemical feature common to various early accounts, it is the Muslim rulers who recover and resuscitate the Hellenistic legacy that the Christian rulers had failed to cultivate. So one could almost say uh, the uh, Muslim uh, Abbasid rulers are kind of uh, humanists securing uh, the heritage of the ancients avant la lettre, of course. After these two accounts, Al Ma'mun's dream and Ibn Khaldun's outline, which exhibit already important factors of the transmission of knowledge that we are interested in, let me summarize and exemplify a few aspects of this pro uh, process as far as contemporary scholarship has explored it. The aspects that may be of primary interesting, in interest, I'm sorry, are the following. Five, what were the institutions of learning in pre-Islamic Alexandria? What subjects were taught? What was the initial interest of the Abbasids in the Hellenistic heritage? Three, what were the ways of transmission of knowledge from Alexandria to Baghdad? Four, what was the role of the translators from Greek into Arabic and what were their methods? And finally, five, what are the main elements of impact that the reception of Hellenistic scholarship in classical Islam had. So for one, what were the institutions of learning in Hellenistic Alexandria? Now, this of course is a rare privilege uh, to be able to stand or sit, in my case, literally in the midst of what was happening here, simply pointing in various direction, directions. Alexander founded Alexandria, as you know, in 331 or 2, I don't know, BC, before he departed for Siwa uh, to consult the famous oracle and then marched off to Persia. He had other things to do. He left one of his generals, Ptolemy, to oversee the development of the new city, and this viceroy eagerly continued this work after Alexander's death. Alexandria was filled with imperial architecture to rival the cities of Rome and Athens, to create a sense of continuity between his rule and that of, of the pharaonic uh, dynasties. Ptolemy made Alexandria look, at least superficially, um, Egyptian by adorning the city with sphinxes, obelisks, and statues scavenged from the old cities, sites of um, Memphis and Heliopolis, many of which you can study if it's, I don't know, if it's reopened by now in the Greco Roman Museum, Al Mathaf al Rumani, is it open? No. And in the Alexandria uh, National Museum on Tariq al Hurriya, certainly the most famous building of Alexandria was its library, in whose successor 
uh, institution we are sitting today. Founded by Ptolemy I in the last year of his life, 283 BC, it occupied the royal quarter, in the royal quarter, a large space adjacent to and in service of the Museon, the museum, a Greek-style temple comprising a peripatos uh, walk in the uh, style of the Athenian Academy, gardens, a reading room, meeting rooms, and lecture halls, and spacious shelves or pigeonholes, we should say, um, for the collection of scrolls, um, or whose number at some point um, is said to have exceeded more than 700,000 titles. The considerable overflow uh, of these papyri was housed in the temple of Serapium, Serapeion, an erstwhile magnificent structure around what today is known as Pompey's Pillar. In 391 AD, so about three, 600 years later, Christians launched a final assault uh, on pagan intellectuals and their institutions and destroyed the Serapeum and its library, leaving just the lonely pillar standing. The site is now little more than rubble, pocked by trenches and holes with a few sphinxes, originally from Heliopolis, a surviving nilometer and the pillar, the only uh, ancient monument, as far as I know, remaining whole and standing today in Alexandria. Alexandria, with its library, its medico-philosophical schools called Academia or Museum, its facilities for the study of astronomy, geography, zoology, etc., understood itself as the successor to the Platonic Academy of Athens. While in its beginnings, Alexandrian scholarship was famous not least for its expertise um, in textual criticism of ancient epic, particularly, of course, uh, Homerus and poetical uh, literature, its main areas of research in late antiquity became philosophy, uh, medicine, and the natural sciences. These were the subjects that were taught in the Alexandrian schools of the three centuries preceding the uh, Muslim conquest of Egypt, and their curriculum was to dominate al-ulum al-qadima in early and classical Islam. Thus, we find among the vast corpus of scholarly texts translated from Greek, in Greek into Arabic, no integral uh, Greek tragedy or comedy or poetry or historiography uh, because their sitz im Leben, their sociological relevance, had already lost much of its impact in later Alexandrian society. But we have almost the whole oeuvre of the classical medical authors, Hippocrates of Galen of Pergamon, Rufus, Paulus of Aegina and Oribasius, as well as of late Alexandrian authors like John Philopodos and others. For the Materia Medica, uh, pharmacology, um, Dioscuridus is the leading authority and his writings were translated and transmitted too. In philosophy, we have first and foremost Aristotle as Al Ma'mun's dream and Ibn Khaldun's account put him forward, whose entire works were studied and commented upon, but also from a later phase of reception, the Platonic Dialogues, the commentaries on the writings of both authors, Plotinus, under the name uh, of the uh, theology of Aristotle, ascribed to Aristotle, but in reality written by Plotinus, and Neoplatonic writings in the form of adaptations of Plotinian writings, of excerpts from Proclus's Elementatio Theologica and the Proclian Liber de Causis, in Arabic, al khair al mahd uh, the, the pure good. Metaphysics, uh, basically. An important vehicle for the transmission of the lives and teachings of ancient philosophers was the vast corpus of the sayings of, or pieces of wisdom, hekam, 
under such titles as Nawadir al Falasifa or Mukhtar al Hikam or Siwan al Hikma, uh, so popular because these collections easily mingled with the tradition of the gnomological teachings of the ancient Orient on the one hand and ideals of classical Arabic literature, uh, secular or religious, on the other side. We even find uh, pieces of hadith next to uh, hikam in, in given uh, collections of this type. For astronomy, the, the so-called al-magest, uh, in Arabic, al-majisti, um, of Ptolemy of Alexandria, not a member of the ruling dynasty, was the most fundamental source. For mathematics, uh, translations began with the elements of Euclid. He figures in, uh, in Ibn Khaldun's account. Um, and the introduction to arithmetic by Nicomachos of Gerasa, that's uh, today's Gerash in, in Jordania. We should not forget that a large undercurrent of the occult sciences, very popular both in late antiquity and early Islam, was also received and worked upon. Astrology, alchemy, the science of talismans, physiognomy, in Arabic, ilm al-firasa, uh, dream interpretation, ilm al-tabir, um, and so on. So this is the program, the curriculum, that was taught in Alexandrian schools and whose uh, copious literature was translated into Arabic. Now let us next ask what was the initial interest of the Abbasids in the Hellenistic heritage. Al-Ma'mun, as you will remember, was interested in the good, Al-Hasan. Ibn Khaldun tells us uh, that the Muslims became versed in many different crafts and sciences. I'm quoting rather literal, literal, literally. Then they desired to study the philosophical disciplines. While Al-Ma'mun's purported dream obviously is carried by a certain ideological tendency, um, Ibn Khaldun's account certainly contains a kernel of truth in the sense that the newly formed Islamic civilization was almost overwhelmed by an influx of new crafts and sciences. Sina'at wa ulum, not only the Hellenistic heritage, but it must be stressed, Sasanian administrative skills and political wisdom, Indian scholarship, old Syriac tra traditions, and ancient Egyptian scientific and religious traditions. It was this wealth of new information that Muslim scholarship tried to come to terms with, and the various early attempts of classifying this information to put all this store of knowledge into some order. You could call these works with, uh, you, you could name it them with a modern term, uh, encyclopedia, maybe. These um, uh, type of uh, encyclopedias are, to my, in my opinion, first class testimonies to Islamic scholarship in classical Islam. Now you find on the backside of my um, handout two such examples, one taken from Al-Farabi's uh, famous Ihsa uh, al-Ulum, catalog um, or census <laughs> of the sciences, and the other one, Maratib um, al-Ulum, the, um, I don't know, Maratib, the, the steps <laughs> um, of the sciences by Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi. Um, and they are meant to show you three things, basically. One, the enormous range of scholarship shaping Islamic culture. Two, the specific genius of the two authors, Al-Farabi and Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, and you can trust me, there are more authors like, like these, the same caliber, like uh, Avicenna um, and uh, the Ikhwana Safan and other authors, um, in integrating, the, the genius was my word, in integrating 
al-'ulum-an-naqliya, let's say, for the uh, sciences centered around uh, the Islam, Islamic faith um, and the Arabic language, with the al-'ulum uh, al-qadima. Uh, and thirdly, um, I think these uh, um, testimonies uh, show certain traces of the Aristotelian heritage. Perhaps it is these classifications of the sciences that is the farthest reaching manifestation of Hellenistic scholarship. It has its roots in Greek logic, Aristotelian logic and his commentators, and a very nice uh, idea uh, um, once um, 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 uh, say, uh, written by Franz Rosenthal, um, who remarked, um, they may have these, these classifications, um, may have their epistemological drawbacks because such classifications tend to create the illusion that what one has classified, one has fully grasped and done with. <laughs> I find this very, uh, a very good um, idea. Still, notwithstanding um, these are precious documents are and, and are precious um, um, manifestations of uh, the endeavor of early Muslim scholarship <laughs> to come to systematic terms with the rich um, influx of the crafts and the sciences. I shall not translate the two passages for you, but simply point out the way of argument of Al-Farabi and Ibn Hazm. Farabi puts the science of language, as you see, um, that's line five. Mm? Uh, the science of language side by side with that of logic. Both are disciplines concerning a faculty common to all human beings and cannot be claimed by a particular faction. This is very, um, very important for uh, Al-Farabi in particular. Um, um, logic, the philosopher Al-Farabi says, corresponds to grammar since the relation of logic to the intellect and the intelligibilia, nice word, in Arabic it's al-maqulad, those things which can be imagined. Um, or not imagined, uh, thought, let's say, or um, um, conceived, okay? Um, uh, the, um, the relation of logic is analogous to the relation of grammar to language and its utterances. Like language and logic, the mathematical sciences those are the four um, uh, uh, usual, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and musical theory. In this um, context, complemented by optics, uh, the science of the weights. You have something like athqal in your text, and, uh, um, and mechanical devices, hayal. So you have a seven-fold. Uh, are universal. Particularly interesting is Al-Farabi's pairing of physics and metaphysics, or theology, al-ilahi, <coughs> another measure to unify Aristotelian and Islamic traditions under one common neutral denominator, the world as a whole, one could say. He does the same in his fifth and last category, linking the theological disciplines, uh, fiqh and kalam, to politics, to worldly politics. As uh, one of the best um, uh, experts on uh, Al-Farabi, Mohsin Mahdi, writes, Al-Farabi seems to be resigned to the multiplicity of lawgivers and religious and juridical disciplines and theologies. Religion is defined in a perfectly neutral manner, and so are the religious sciences. Second, jurisprudence and theology are not substitutes for political science or alternative uh, approaches to the study of political life." End of quote. Knowledge, one may, one may sum up, is one and universal. 
Now, Ibn Hazm presents a different, um, equally uh, ingenious system of the sciences. He divides them into those that are particular to every ummah, every nation you might translate, and those with universal uh, validity. Um, those that are particular are, in his, uh, in his uh, numbering three, Sharia history, interestingly. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, individual history of a given ummah, and language, of course. And the four uh, universal uh, sciences he names uh, astronomy, arithmetic, medicine, and philosophy going on, in, uh, or defining philosophy, including knowledge of all matters as they are according to their definition from the highest genera to the individual particulars, as well as knowledge of di div divine matters, which is, um, you could call it either uh, metaphysics or theology. Again, this author maintains the unity of all knowledge only marking the border between universal sciences and the Ummah related sciences, adding, however, that all religious laws, with the exception of Islamic Sharia, are now, at the time of Ibn Hazm writing, and since some time before him, invalid. I think his term is Bartil or Ibtal or something. I'm quoting. Hence, it is necessary to concentrate on the true religion, religious law, and on everything that can deepen our knowledge of it. The science of Sharia is divided into four parts. Now, this is, uh, again, um, uh, as we know it, the science of the Quran, the science of the Hadith, Fiqh, and Kalam. So this is one more important factor that prompted early Islamic culture to make use of Hellenistic scholarship to bring the wealth of new knowledge into a coherent system to unify Elm. Other equally important factors are more mundane disciplines like medicine, pharmacology, astronomy, not to forget astrology, were seen as eminently practical. And if we read the history of the translation of Hellenistic writings correctly, it is these disciplines that aroused uh, the interest of the Abbasid rulers in the first place. But Galenic medicine, for instance, is itself philosophical structured, uh, uh, as is the discipline of the macrocosmos, the, uh, uh, the teaching of physics and of cosmology. Thus, according to a um, uh, colleague, uh, Len Goodman, what was sought by the Abbasid rulers, what was sought was what was useful, but the concept of the useful was itself becoming enlarged. Translation were undertaken initially to learn the therapy of for a given disease to solve a practical problem of geometry or engineering to make available methods by which future events could be predicted or human fortunes made secure, to acquire tools for refuting a theological adversary. But the Greek works bear with them their own context, assumptions, cross-references, -refer above all, their own problematic. One work leads to another. Insensibly, pragmatic interest breeds academic expertise, the drive to completeness of scholarship or system. And this uh, end of quote um, uh, of um, the book by um, uh, Goodman, and this is, you remember exactly what Ibn Khaldun means when he says, I quote again, the Muslims read those works and studied their contents their desire to obtain the rest of them grew. Wazdadu hirsan ala zafar bima baqiya minha. Three, what were the ways of transmission of knowledge from Alexandria to Baghdad? I, you will be relieved, I must be brief with this section because not really much is known about this uh, question. 
it is still a matter of dispute how direct and continuous the scholar tradition from Alexandria to Baghdad was. Older scholarship relies on the accounts of Muslim authorities like Al-Farabi, the same uh, author we've just met, who construed uh, an uninterrupted teaching tradition of Aristotle work, Aristotle's works uh, from Alexandria to Baghdad with Antioch and Harran as relay stations, and similar accounts by the historians Al-Masoudi, uh, Ali ibn Ridwan, the, the Kyrene uh, colleagues will know him. He was a, a medical author from Gizeh. And um, Hiba Tala al jumai is another author, uh, the Jewish physician to the Sultan Salah Adin, who wrote on this historiographical uh, question of how uh, the road went from Alexandria to Baghdad. Now, um, the latter two physicians attribute a general decay of the medical art after the one and only uh, Galen, the, the arch physician after Hippocrates, of course, um, to the Alexandrian Christian authorities. Again, the Christians are the, are the bad ones, who, they write, had no interest in intellectual matters and were content to work with abridged and popularized uh, compendia and, um, and uh, textbooks called uh, the Sumaria Alexandrinorum. In Arabic, it's Al Jawamia Al Iskandaraniyin, um, condensed uh, textbooks of the mostly writings of uh, the physician of uh, Galen. Now, recent scholarship has indicated a political interest, as is documented in the accounts mentioned above, that reflects the policy of the Abbasids to highlight their humanist role in safeguarding the heritage of Greek scholarship, contrary to the policy of the Byzantines. As a matter of fact, uh, the tradition from Alexandria to Baghdad was carried to a considerable extent uh, but not exclusively by Christian teachers and writers. So there are conflicting, um, 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 conflicting reports. More importantly, the chain of that tradition was by no means a single and continuous route. Rather, one has to assume a simultaneous existence of philosophical and medical schools in the Hellenized cities of the Near East. Now the catchword, uh, Christian teachers and writers, brings us to part four. What was the role of the translators from Greek into Arabic, and what were their methods? In the first place, who were the translators? A few of them were Syriac-speaking pagans, the Sabian um, scholars of Harran, who also knew Greek, as their religious language, that of late pagan uh, spirituality. The vast majority, however, were Aramaic, Syriac-speaking Christians who knew Greek as a liturgical language and given the pre-Islamic Greco-Syriac scientific translations, in some cases also as a scientific language. These translators from Greek and Syriac themselves belong to the Christian churches dominant in the Fertile Crescent. We have Melkites or Orthodox like Bitriq and Yahya ibn Bitriq, his son, and Qusta ibn Luqa. We have Jacobites like Abd al-Masih ibn Na'ima al-Himsi and Yahya ibn Adi. And we have prominently Nestorians like the family of the best translator of them all, Hunayn ibn Ishaq and Matta ibn Yunus. Now this is, as you see, a, an extraordinarily felicitous coincidence in intellectual history. We have a bulk of fascinating scientific literature organized and prepared for study in schools, mainly done in Alexandria. We have highly motivated circles right at the Abbasid court commissioning the translation of these works. 
And we have more or less trilingual translators, Greek, Syriac, Arabic, prepared to undertake this task. For a philologian like myself, it is fascinating to follow the course of consecutive uh, translations undertaken in the two, um, that is to say, the eighth to the 10th uh, centuries. And I would very much um, like to go into this particular questions of how the translation technique um, was um, uh, changing during this time for the better, but uh, my a personal <laughs> ethics of education tell me that I might, at this point of my lecture, strain your patience too much. Suffice it to point out the linguistic difficulties that the translators from Greek into Arabic, two very different language faced. Just a few remarks. There's that basically two problems, one of scientific terminology and one of syntax. And uh, in terminology, we can, we can distinguish between three approaches to uh, tackle the problem. One is the simplest, of course, transcription. W some of these transcriptions exist still today in, uh, in modern Arabic, like musiqi uh, or musika, uh, taken, of course, from uh, uh, Greek musike, uh, or uh, the term geographia sometimes supplanted by the word sura del ard, or the word, I don't know whether you still have it in your language, uh, melancholia, does it, does it say something? No. Which is uh, melancholy, and uh, this is, all of them are the type translator. Uh, uh, well, it's al mirra sauda, and the tempera temperament which is based on that, melan melancholy. Hmm? Now, that would be one approach. A second approach would be, um, what, what, uh, what is it called? Um, um, uh, um, Lehn Übersetzung, I think, loan translation. You will see in a second what I mean by it. A translation of the constituents of the parts of a given word. Uh, for instance, you have in Greek, leptomeres, which means fine or delicate in regard of a part organ of the body, translated uh, in Arabic very elegantly by Latif al-Ajza. You have the uh, leptos by Latif and uh, the meres by Juz or Ajza. Or a plant I have noted here called um, Potamogeiton, literally to be translated as a neighbor of a, um, of a river, um, Potamos river. Um, uh, an, a, a kind of herb also used for medical um, uh, uh, treatment, uh, translated very elegant, ag elegantly again into Arabic as jar an nahr. So that the, 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 the same plant is called jar an nahr. And thirdly, you have uh, an equally um, uh, elegant way of um, of opening new uh, fields of terminology by uh, coining um, a given Arabic word with a terminology, terminological function. Uh, for instance, qiyas, which actually means measuring, something like that, um, takes on the terminological function in fiqh as analogical reasoning and in logic as syllogistic operation. And even more interesting is the, fields, uh, is the field of syntax, but I'll spare you that. <laughs> um, just one final point. Much of what Honein ibn Ishaq, he died in 873, and his colleagues achieved in this respect in making their Arabic language surrounding them malleable, as it were. Um, uh, this, uh, what, what they achieved found um, its way into post-classical Arabic uh, and is now part of everyday educated Arabic. 
Now for my last questions, what are the main elements of impact that the reception of Hellenistic scholarship in Islam had, I can point to no less than four features that have already been mentioned. One, the philosophical, medical, natural science related works that were translated in themselves um, immensely added to the public knowledge and research in Abbasid Islam and thereafter. Two, logical and other forms of reasoning refined the scholarly discourse in general. Ironically, even authors attacking the presumptions of Hellenistic um, uh, philosophy, like Al-Ghazali, uh, Al used uh, the methods of logic, and consciously so. I mean, Al-Ghazali knew what he was doing. Three, Aristotelian classification of the sciences greatly influenced the Islamic encyclopedias, such as Al-Farabi's and Ibn Hazm's, and helped achieve a unified system of knowledge. And four, Arabic scholarly language, what I just said, finally was in many ways shaped due to the linguistic challenge that the Greek um, scientific texts put to it. A final fifth feature consists, as, it, as is to be expected, in the influx of Hellenistic concepts into fields such as theology and ethics. And I have given you uh, very small examples in the last box of my handout, Miska Way's Tahdib al Akhlaq. Um, but I'm afraid I have to pass it over. It's from the Tahdib al Akhlaq, uh, the refinement of uh, character, um, if you want, by the famous historian and philosopher, a rare combination, historian and philosopher, Miska Way, from Buyid uh, times. He died in 1030. The context is the hierarchy of the virtues, for Da'il, uh, the lowest of which are um, enacted in the world of uh, the senses, al-alam al-mahsus. It says in uh, this snippet which I have um, um, copied for you here, mm. and points, uh, I'm sorry, um, Al Mahsus, note that already here the principle of moderation, a catchword which was quite prominent in the course of our conference. Do you remember the not too much on this side, not too much on that side, the Eatidal, um, the moderation, the Qadr Mu'tadil Rayr Mufrit, Al Miskaway formulate, is to be observed. Ms. Kawai then goes on to discuss human ethical endeavor without being disturbed by <coughs> bodily pleasures and points out the factors of different uh, natures between human beings. So he, um, he maintains that not every human being has the cha same chances from the beginning. Uh, they, are they, they, are, they, they have different natures, they have different start position uh, or habits to be acquired. That's where learning begins, of education. And finally, very uh, uh, realistically, he says, and also finally, of the factor of chance. In a last stage, human virtue can reach a divine status, he says. This is not on your page, uh, which has its reward in itself. It is a fascinating passage, on the one hand, pointing to Aristotelian ideas, on the other, leading to what Al-Ghazali will later have to say, and Sufi authors. Before closing this lecture, I would like to stress two crucial um, uh, uh, qualifications, in the sense of however, um, that we have to keep in mind when we study the transfer of Hellenistic scholarship to Islam. The first is to become or stay <laughs> aware of the fact that those sciences that Al-Farabi and Ibn Hazm, and generally all authors of classifications of the sciences in Islam, enlist as Islamic sciences, such as Arabic language, uh, fiqh, kalam, hadith, al um, tafsir al-Quran, coexisted with and even antedate uh, al-ulum al-Qadima, ab about which I have been talking prominently, uh, for good reasons. 
but we have to be aware that they coexisted and that um, the scientific or the scholarly um, uh, uh, study of the Islamic sciences uh, went on already in Baghdad and elsewhere uh, while uh, these works were translated. That is to say, the texts and methods how to study the Islamic sciences were already fully developed and open to further improvement and refinement when the Greco-Arabic translation movement began. Hans Deiber, sorry, he's not here and can hear me, uh, in an essay on the beginnings of scholarship in Islam published in 1978 writes, I quote, the philological sciences of the early Muslim scholars are the result of their studies on the Quran. The form and the contents and the specific character of the Quran, its Ijaz uh, character, had to be fathomed by philological means. The art of definition and the study of the connection between meaning and linguistic sign, ma'ana and love, were at the center of their endeavors. And another field of early research was jurisprudence, which dealt with the problem of complementing the sources of Quran and Hadith by mobilizing logical, rational instruments of deductive uh, analogy and other means. Both these fields, philology and jurisprudence, were in full bloom when Hellenistic scholarship found its way into Islam. And I venture to say uh, that without these indigenous achievements, without the linguistic awareness and the logical refinement of fiqh developed by Muslim scholars, um, a proper reception of the Greek heritage would not have happened in the way it did. And a second and final point is speaking of teaching. Speaking of teaching, teacher and student, sender and recipient. It has often been stated, especially in traditional Western scholarship, that the Greeks were the teachers sitting high up there, uh, and the Arab down there, the students eagerly and obediently translating and copying the scholarly literature that was transmitted to them, and that there the Arabs' uh, historical role <coughs> is confined to storing this accumulated knowledge and handing it over to Western Latin uh, medieval or Renaissance scholarship. This is wrong on two counts. Arabic scholarship, be it conducted by Muslims, Christians, or Jews, was a highly innovative and critical business. One of the first examples of this investiga investigative um, attitude is the famous philosopher of the Arabs, Al-Kindi, about whom we know uh, that um, he uh, commissioned, actively commissioned translation of a given text and creatively making use of it in the face of some problem, problem which he was facing, be it cosmological, be it metaphysical, be it practical. A few authors, like Abu Bakr al-Razi or Avicenna even wrote critical works against certain uh, tenets of the ancient authorities, Galen and Aristotle. A great deal, um, this is very interesting and um, not very uh, widely known, a great deal of critique or modification uh, of accepted knowledge is buried in commentaries. Uh, to the canonical works, and sometimes in very inconspicuous places. So it really is worth to study uh, the, the commentaries, not always the primary texts. The second count is even more important. In many fields, uh, research was carried on uh, way beyond the literature. This is my last page. <laughs> um, inherited from the ancients. I wish I were more competent in the disciplines of mathematics, uh, optics, uh, astronomy, where, the experts tell us, scholars like Al-Kashi, Ibn Yunus, Ibn Al-Haytham, Nasir al-Din Tusi, 
carried re their research to entirely new borders. In the fields that I have a certain command of, philosophy and medicine, there is certainly noticeable such innovations way beyond that ominous date, 1258, in which year some scholars, Arab and European, maintain that Islamic civilization went into decline. And way beyond Baghdad, Al-Andalus on the one side, and Iran, Transoxania, India on the other. But don't forget, it all began in Alexandria. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Mr. Field, for the <coughs> very informative lecture and for sharing with us um, this important information.